Hi, I'm Bill Seiler. Hi, Bill. One of the early uh, Commodore engineers. I don't know what my employee number was. <laughs> 12, 10. Do you still have your car ID card? I don't think there was ah. an ID card. We weren't that organized. Oh. <laughs> I showed up. Well, where I showed up is uh, I had come out to California in my little yellow Honda car, driven all the way across the country from Florida. I was born in Florida. And I met Chuck out here. And I drove out, and my friend Larry, the same guy I was mentioning before, was living down in Santa Monica. So I went and hung out with him, and then I went to Hawaii, and my brother was in Hawaii, and I came back. And uh, Electronic Times had this big spread about this Commodore computer they were going to build. Chuck had done this thing, and it was kind of some sort of political thing he had done. He had leaked it to Electronic News or Electronic Times. Because Jack wasn't sure he wanted to fund the whole project. And now, oh, it's all over the news. Now we're going to make a $495 <laughs> personal computer. Back then, they were selling for thousands of dollars. And I think he had to go ahead and do it. And I saw this, and I, I was down in Santa Monica, and I called Chuck. He was up in Silicon Valley. And Chuck said, get up here. Because <laughs> he had known me from uh, earlier days when I would met him in Florida. What year was that, uh, do oh, you think? must have been the late 70s. 77? Something like that. 76? I had met him. I was working in Miami as a technician at a co company called Allied Leisure. We were making video games and stuff. And at that time, all the microprocessors were coming out, and all the sales guys came by and said, oh, we got this Mostech thing, or we got this Intel thing, and you could do your pinball game, because we had electronic pinball games. They still had the balls and the bing, bing, bing thing, but they had electronics to do all the readouts and stuff. Ours was poorly designed and hard to manufacture, and so they all were trying to sell us microprocessors. And so we kind of took their demo boards, and it's pretty easy, but you got to write a lot of code. Yeah. And Chuck came by, he was at that time trying to get people to build the 6502 into things. And I think he had just succeeded in getting Atari to build the 2600 and buy the chips. He had a good story about that. The 2600 guys were just tickled pink, because at the time Intel processors were $200 or something like oh. that. And they got this deal for, for 6502s for their game for only $20. And Chuck <laughs> said, we were making them for five. So <laughs> we were tickled pink too, because they were yielding really high. And at the time, uh, Intel wasn't getting like 30% yield on their 8080s or whatever they were. They were using the projection aligners and the newer process technology, and they were getting like 80% yield on their processors. So they could make $5 processors. And he, they, they weren't getting enough business, so Chuck was traveling around the country, and he came to us and said, we'll give you the 6502 and all these great peripherals, and I'll write the code. And he did. He wrote the code for that pinball game. He sat there for like two weeks with me and the other guys in the place, and he wrote the code for our pinball game. He had like a one big board, sort of like the big board in the pet, it had a 6502 and it had a lot of suspicious peripheral chips around so he could sell us lots of chips. <laughs> but pinball games have a lot of switches and things they got to do. And uh, in fact, it even had uh, the stuck switch problem. Pinball games tend to have these little leaf switches for all the switches and they get stuck as they get old. And if they stay on, they leave a coil on and the coil burns up and that doesn't work anymore. He put software in there that would turn that off if it was stuck for a long huh. time. The pinball game had some resilience to it. So. Uh, what pinball game was that, or was games? It, oh, we made remember? a number of games with it. Basically, what it did is it uh, managed all the whatever the game strategy was for the play field we were doing, and it it handled all the displays. There was like four different readouts up on the back. Hmm. He basically wrote the segment. pinball OS. Yeah, I don't think this is that. Chuck's code <laughs> is never that organized. <laughs> <laughs> he he just kind of he would write assembly code with no comments in it. So you were hired into CBM by Chuck Peddle, or how, how did that work? He called me up. I called him up because I saw this article, and I said, um, what's going on? He says, get up here, Siler. We need to get to work. <laughs> so I drove my yellow car all the way up to, to Santa, uh, Santa Clara, and he was actually in Palo Alto with Commodore, because Commodore had a building. And I don't think I got back to because I just drove my car up. I left all my stuff down in L.A., and I didn't get back there for like a month. I was like living in Chuck's house okay. because <laughs> he had me immediately working on stuff, fixing, because they just had a really crude proto prototype that they had kind of clued together uh, with uh, Peter Sunnell. They'd got some prototype boards that had been worked work at another company and they clued together and they had the first wooden pet. Oh, there you, you go. Know about the wooden the pet. Wooden pet. Yeah. It's a there rounded pet that doesn't have the square corners that Chuck had had an industrial designer do so that they could come out of a mold. They were, you know, like 
paper cup, sort of plastic cup shape, paper, nice smooth look to it. And they clue huh? The one that was designed by Porsche? No, that came later. Might have been. Oh, okay. No, this was the designed by I don't know who did it. It was really nice, smooth looking kind of slick looking. It design. was pine or <laughs> hardwood? Hard wood. I think okay. Fagan still has it. Okay. Leonard doesn't know that, but I think John, <laughs> John Fagan still has the the wood. He has it pet. up in his attic. You He's not telling anybody if he does. Well, now, <laughs> keeping it quiet. John now, now, is now the everybody knows. Guy he, he somehow I ended, ended up with that pet. So I came up and I was immediately put to work. I think he threw me on doing a couple of major things that had done, like the IEEE interface on the pet. We, we knew we wanted to have some kind of bus to put floppies and printers on. And at the time, HP had this IEEE 480 bus, and it was a parallel bus, and it was pretty fancy and nice. It had really robust connectors and everything, but it was kind of expensive. And uh, so we, we adopted that, and the, uh, they helped us. I think the HP guys kind of helped us a little bit. And I designed the hardware. It was pretty much just I.O. came out to some buffers, and it went out the connector. And turned out I kind of under-designed that. It was a big failing later on, because IEEE has some high-speed stuff that goes on that you can't really do all in software. We were trying to do everything in software because that was Chuck's idea. You do as much stuff in software as mm. you can to keep the hardware simple so you can mm. make the computer inexpensive. And there's some stuff that has to happen really fast on the bus that we could never do in software. So being a master, you can kind of get away with that. But if you were doing anything more elegant than that, you needed a little more stuff. And the floppy had to do that. Or it had to be a little smarter and they had to make hardware to do that. They eventually did, but uh, and the other thing he had me do was the self-test. I think there was a self-test in the power on self-test. Right. When it came up, it uh -huh. would check a lot of things, memory tests, and things like that. That was the first thing I worked on. And then the display had a problem in the first pets. So, so, so you worked on the pet 2001, the first one yeah, that yeah. that came out. The, the original pets. When you wrote a character to the screen, you'd steal the screen memory away from the uh, refreshing that was go constantly going on to keep characters on the screen. You'd, you'd have to take the memory away and put a character on the screen. So there was an arbitration issue there in the original pest. When you wanted to put a character on the screen, it would do it. But you get a black flash on the screen. It was really ugly if you were doing it real fast. Scrolling was really ugly. So they only would refresh the screen when you couldn't see it during a re retrace. You know, when that was. So, and we changed that on the next next machine. We actually redesigned the bus and the processor so it would do that. Who? That's, that's something I did. Who was responsible for the chiclet keyboard on the PET 2001? That awful little... I would say that's Mr. <laughs> Fujiyama. Okay, the that Japanese awful little engineers, keyboard. There was two. Uh, I can't remember the other guy, because I worked with him later. He was he was right. He was our kind of our technician. I'll think of it later. But Mr. Fujiyama was one of the calculator engineers that was at Commodore Palo Alto. And okay. He said we needed a keyboard, so he glued together like three or four calculator keyboards and sent it off to Japan. <laughs> and they came back and they had these nice little pretty characters all over them stuck on the top and, and we needed to have a small enough keyboard to put the cassette in beside it because yeah, yeah. we only uh -huh. had so much room you know the story of the metal box right that's because of you the, better tell them <laughs> okay you know, well there was this nice wooden model and they were going to have to make molds and it was going to cost hundreds of thousands of dollars for these large molds and everything jack didn't want to do that it was too expensive it didn't have the budget for it but he had this company up in Canada that was making office furniture and file cabinets. So they sent the wood model up there, and the guys in Canada kind of bent some metal together and sent it back. We had these metal Darth Vader looking things. <laughs> okay. And um, they, they decided to make the first pets out of that metal because they had a company that could make it, and they weren't that busy, you know. They were cranking out metal pets. The reason they kind of open up like this is because I was telling people today there's. We, we had a development system that we did all the development on. It's called an MDS, and it, the only printer we had was a uh, Silent 700 made by TI. It was like a little printing terminal kind of thing, and it opened up like that. And you had to like change the paper or something. And we really liked that. I said, that, that's really easy to work on. So we said, well, just copy that. That's Because <laughs> the first pets came, they were just like two pieces, and you had to take all these screws off, and you could, it couldn't open it up to work on it. It just opened up and had a little bar. And, Wow, that was a good idea. So we stole that from Texas Instrument. It's called the Silent 700. We had a really funky, crazy development system, but it worked really well when you were debugging code. It had one line display <laughs> that you would had to type all your code in and do everything on, like a one line display. Maybe it was two lines. It was really 40 characters and like a neon kind of looking thing. But it had really good debugging capability. It had a trace stack. So if you 
ran into a bad opco, but it would stop. And you could go back like a thousand instructions and see it and disassemble it and see what went wrong. Because typically when you're writing code, you go out in the weeds somewhere and execute a bad instruction. Your code would crash. With this development system, which plugged into the 6502 slot, you could go back and retrace stuff, find the bug, you know. Oh, gee, I wrote on something, or messed up the stack. The stack was usually the big killer in a 6502. So, so uh, uh, better minds prevailed when the PET 2001 got a full-size keyboard instead of that the little was the Japanese keyboard. guys that were pushing. Well, no. who pushed for the full-size keyboard? Well, we knew we were going to build a bigger machine for the business. Oh, okay, we couldn't have that chiclet keyboard. Okay, I mean, the chiclet keyboard actually worked in our favor exactly ah. the beginning. Because the kids were not intimidated by it. Oh. You weren't like, don't break the typewriter, you know, when the kids walk up to the typewriter and push all the keys and they all fly up there and get stuck, you know. And uh, this little keyboard, they were, they loved it. It was perfect for their little fingers. Mm. So the elementary school kids mm. could play with it and they didn't wow. feel like they were breaking mom's typewriter or anything. By, it, was, yeah. it was very friendly. Definitely they liked, the right size. They were just the right size. Yeah. <laughs> they liked that keyboard. Because initially we did a lot of stuff with kids in schools and things like that. But yeah. The serious keyboard came when we started doing like the 80 columns and the bigger were machines. Were you part of the, the, the PET 4032 development? Which one was that? That's the, that 40 the, the 40 column yeah. PET uh, that came after the 2001. Well, there was a DRAM design. We decided to get out of static RAM and go to DRAM. And that was, uh, we had this cowboy guy who was an engineer. He, he, I, he was like a classic cowboy. He had boots and... <laughs> And I think his, his girlfriend raised horses and stuff, but he designed the circuit that drove the DRAM because we knew DRAM was what's going to happen in the future because it's cheap and get big RAM. He designed the circuit to make that work, and then we pushed that into the, the I think the 4232 was the first ones that were like the 16K and the 32K. Uh -huh, yes. Yeah. Those were DRAM based. The 4016, yeah, the 4016. There was a funny story. 4016 and 16 We had the 4K pad and we had the 8K pad in the beginning. And we were doing this with static RAM. That wasn't too hard because the RAMs were like 1K increments. But when, and for a while there, we were buying parts from Moss Tech. They To make the 8K pets, we were buying their bad 16K D RAMs or something. Static uh, RAMs. <laughs> or was it the, yeah, I think they were 16Ks or 8, no, they were 8Ks, but they had a, a bad bit in one half. And they'd send them to you and they'd tell you which half was bad so you'd tie some jumper high or low and only use the good half. <laughs> but of course, memory guys get better and better. And, they didn't have them anymore after a while. So he went to the Japanese and tried to buy half bad DRAM because we're still making the smaller machines. And the Japanese just said, no, we don't sell parts that are half bad. We just don't do that. Because it, their pride was really, you know, yeah. that, that's just, you know, they, they could fail and our name would be on it. It would look good for us, you know. And so we couldn't buy them, so we had to figure out another way. And then we started making the uh, same motherboard for this 32 and 16K. and. The users figured out real quick they could buy a 16K for cheaper and then put their own DRAMs in there and make it a 32K. Jack didn't like that. So he figured out, got the engineers to figure out where to drill holes in the board. Yeah. So that we, you couldn't do that to sabotage that whole thing. I used to go to the user group meetings and they were like at the Lockheed building and somewhere in Santa Clara. Yeah, Santa Clara, the Lockheed building. room like this big, uh -huh. full of pets. Oh, wow. And they had a huge library of games and stuff in, on little cassettes, and you could go down there and go down and give wow. them your driver's license, and they'd give you the newest <laughs> game, and you could take it back to your pet, and you could load it in your pet, and then you could save a copy on your floppy, I mean, your little cassette, and you'd get it back. Wow. There was this tremendous turmoil of, of ideas and stuff coming in, and people came in with the greatest crazy things, you know, and they were working on all sorts of different things, like one guy, Nestor, developed a networking system, kind of like the token ring thing IBM had for a while. They use pets. They, they used the user ports to hook pets together in the schools, and they kind of went to some sort of a hard drive server that had all the stuff that kids were doing, you know, hmm. games or what they were studying. That was all first networking I ever saw. So there was a guy, you know, it was called Nestor or something like that, was done with pets. He had a really clever way he was tessellating the data lines so that he could figure out which one he was addressing. The lines would like rotate right uh -huh. on the 8-bit data bus as they went between each machine so that they, you know, he explained it to me and it was really clever so that you could figure out who was the right machine to talk to by what the message was or something like that. And there was all sorts of wonderful little games and tricky things people were doing back then. 
user groups are just you never can imagine what those guys think of. So these were these were the user groups around the Santa Clara area. Yeah, uh. it's pretty active. But there was other groups. There's a big one up in Canada. Jim Butterfield. And oh yeah, those guys. Toronto Pet User Group. Yeah, yeah, they yes, they're they're still guys. around. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I remember I used to get. I meet Jim sometimes at one of the big computer shows. He could come down for him once in a while, but he was always my go-to source for some tricky thing. Like I needed a random number generator, and Jim gave me like five lines of code assembler <laughs> to get a really good, simple random number generator <laughs> for a game or something. It's always good for stuff like that. Just had a wealth of stuff to pull out of a happy bag. And then you, you went to uh, work on the, the PET 8032 then? Yeah, we were doing a business model because Chuck's whole program was to move up scale to get into more right. professional machines, have you know, floppies and hard drives and stuff. Yeah, it, the, the big difference there was to whole redesign the video circuit. The one in the original 40 column PET was discrete TTL and the 8032 used the uh, Motorola 6845 video mm -hmm. generation mm -hmm. chip. Basically this chip generated what a whole bunch of TTL chips did to make the logic for counters and everything for your uh, video. And it was real programmable, so you could set the number of characters on the line, how many lines, and refresh rate, and all that stuff with a bunch of registers. So it eliminated a ton of other parts to use this nice chip, and that's what it was based on. And it was uh, basically the same display, just kind of double wide, so we could get 80 columns. We had to push the video a little harder, you know, faster bits. That was bad. It wasn't that hard of a design to do. What else did we change at that time? The keyboard got bigger, but I think it already got bigger in the right. earlier machine. Um, after the PET 8032, uh, I don't. I'm getting kind of wavy on my sequence of events. Then, did you work on after that? You worked directly on the toy, on the. Well, we were constantly trying to do something in color. Because Apple was beating us up really okay. bad with their Apple II and, and, color. And, the, and toys stood for the other intellect? Actually, Not I, really? I, just, I just picked the name because uh, everybody said it was going to kind of be a game playing thing. And okay. I wanted to sort of sound Japanese because Jack was all <laughs> on this thing about we got to beat the Japanese, they're coming, you know, yeah, they're yeah. come and wipe us out. Because they had done that to the music industry and the sound mm. business. You know, all the audio stuff turned into Japanese stuff, stole that whole business away. So he was figuring they were going to come after us. And, so I called it a toy that was kind of like a toy game, kind of oh, game okay. machine. But I think the other internet came from Chuck or somebody oh, else. Okay. He tried to find an acronym for it. So that was supposed to be a 40 column color pet, you know, kind of like oh. an Apple II thing. You know. And they really, initially, we tried to do is take the Vic chip, which was, Vic was designed for, for Atari. That's what it was originally designed. Atari hmm. had 2600, which was an amazing chipset. It was like a processor and a video chip. It had all of 128 bytes of RAM in it. And it did all those crazy games you saw, Pac-Man and everything, 128 bytes of RAM. Because the 6502 in that was doing every scan line of the video. It would preload the 128 bytes with what it had to do on that one little scan line. And that's all it was doing. While the display was being refreshed, the 6502 was very busy updating the display. It couldn't do anything with the game. It only played the game when you retraced it. And at that time, while well, the thing was retracing back to the top to start another screen. So that's the only time the game actually played. Yeah, it was really amazing. But they, they wanted a future, better game, and the guys at MOS had designed the Vic chip, which was nice. It did lots of sound things, and it had, you know, they didn't have all this crazy... It used real memory, and it was, you know... But they didn't want it. Atari didn't really want the chip. Hmm. It wasn't good enough, or whatever. They probably were working on their real machine on the side. They came out with their uh, play console, you know, their, their computer, I think, is what they were really working on. So it was sort of in limbo. Nobody was buying the VIC. And I had samples of it, and I didn't look at it. I think we saw the guys at MOS build a prototype, and they kind of took it to one of our back room shows. Yanis had clued together a uh -huh. new chip with 6502, but it only, it didn't have any basic, it didn't do any programming, it just had like a demo. It could show its, you know, color and its graphics. And Bobby Ennis worked on the toy? No, he was working on something to make Jack happy, Jack happy, because okay. the toy was getting late, we couldn't get the chips to work for it. They were trying to clue together two Vic chips to make 40 columns, because the, the Vic could only do about 20 columns on the screen, because it just wasn't fast enough, and that scheme wasn't working out to try to kludge two together. They were trying to save all the design they had in the Vic, 
move it into this toy computer chip. Well, so well, we never really were successful in getting a Vic chip to you know, work as a toy computer chip. What was Chuck Peddle's opinion of the toy? Oh, he was pretty supportive of me. He was, you know, he wanted to go after it. He, he you know, figured that's a market. Apple's definitely getting somewhere with it. And there were some other color computers out there, so he wanted to go after it. The toy never really got, I think we had some almost working, but there was lots of little funny things going on in the fringes, you know. We got close to almost working, but I think we were just pushing too hard to get the memory to go fast enough. Hmm. We were still, I think, using static RAM back then. So it kind of got stuck, and Jack was just ranting that he's got to have something for CES. You know and Yanis was responding back at MOS, and he, he had clued something together at home with a, with a big chip, and they had this demo, and they showed it to Jack, and said, okay, ship that. <laughs> and Chuck saw it, and he said, there's no language. The people want basic. They want something they can program, you know. And you had to plug all kinds of cartridges and things into to do, get it to do anything, you know. And the guys back there kind of sold Jack that this, this was the next thing. So I came back, and I had been playing around with the Vic. I think I had built a breadboard and hooked it up to a, a pet. I kind of cut a pet board in half, because half the board was processors and ROMs and all that. The other half was the video circuitry. Uh -huh. And you could pretty much cut it in half and I wired up a Vic to it, and I, I had some characters on the screen, and it was kind of working, and Chuck saw that and said, well, you got to finish this, because <laughs> he was planning on showing that to Jack. And I think we had to rewrite the cassette code, because that wouldn't work at the clock speed that the Vic was running at. He, he had to rediscover how his cassette code worked. He had written that many, many years before on the pet. It was a real complicated interrupt code. Lots of stuff. Remember when he was designing that, he kind of exploited my back history of working on the digital group, group computer and Tarbell. There was a bunch of audio cassette ways of recording computer data back okay. then in the uh -huh. early uh -huh. days that we kind of picked the best of each one. But the Commodore scheme ultimately ended up because you wrote two copies on the right. floppy, I mean the little cassette. The There's really cassette. two copies that the program saved. The second copy you don't usually ever need. But if the first one got errors, you could read the second one and fix them. You know, you can kind of error correct that way. So there's really always two copies. So that's kind of why it's half as fast as a lot of the other schemes. But it was complicated interrupt code. Lots of things going on. He was doing all this timer interrupts and edge interrupts on things. And so we got that working on the Vic and uh, figured out a scheme to make the color by just inserting color characters into the stream. So if you wanted red, you'd print a red character, and then anything after that was red. And that was real easy to do. It stayed, stayed with the character font kind of thing we were doing before. Um, did Chuck Peddle, well, Chuck, the, I hear that Chuck Peddle wanted to go for, you know, business machines. But the VIC-20 was not a business machine. No. It was, it Jack was, for, was really going to the low end of the market. Right. I remember having that discussion with him at one time. And I, I think I asked him, would you rather be selling Mercedes or Volkswagens? And he said, Mercedes. So I, I didn't understand why he went for the low end. And he, he'd rather be selling the high price thing for more money. As a businessman, that's what he thought was better. But he obviously wanted to go into the low end of the market. He felt that that's where they could do good, you know, with the, the cheaper or lower cost uh -huh. computers. And Chuck was really pushing for the bigger machines because he thought that was the next thing, the PC-like machines. And were you neutral in this, or did you favor one over the other? I didn't. I wasn't that. You know, I did the 80 column pet, you know, but I wasn't into the business software or anything like that. I liked the games and the graphics and the color. I, I really wanted to do that stuff too. I thought that was more fun. And uh, so that's kind of why he stuck me on the toy project. We were working on that. We never got the chips to make it go. <laughs> they just never were reliable enough. I mean, there was a lot of crazy things that came out of MS technology. We had dynamic ROMs. You ever heard of such a thing? No. <laughs> the, the, you know, the ROMs are in there. They came up with some ROMs, and we were using them for a while in the pet. And they were pretty cheap, because MOS could make ROMs for the basic and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And I, the guys on the line kept saying, "There's some of these are failing. So I went down there with a the scope, and it was doing something weird. And then I got the logic liner and hooked all this stuff up to it. And every once in a while, you'd be reading an instruction from the ROM, and instead of getting the instruction, you get all ones. FF. I said, what's going on here? And I finally called the guys in MLS that designed the ROMs. Says, oh, these are they, they use the address lines to pump up something in the in the chip to drive the output buffers to drive the chip. I said, what? I said, yeah, we got to use we're using the upper four address lines, and if they have to be, they have to be wiggling 
worked to make the charge pump work. Was, but it just so happened, Murphy's Law or whatever, there was a structure of the code didn't wiggle the lines enough and the thing would collapse every once in a while. Some chips would work. It's a dynamic ROMs. That's MOS for you. <laughs> Some trick that came back and bought us and bit us later on. We quickly stopped using those. Mm. Then for a while, Jack was trying to get MOS to build RAMs. They had these RAMs that you guys probably saw those in the early days. The, the infancy curve is supposed to get to almost zero. They never did. They just kept burning out. The longer you kept using these, these static RAMs, they kept dying. They never, ever stopped dying. You could guarantee by you know, 10 years, they were all been dead. Because oh. there was something about them overheating or something. And so <coughs> they never succeeded in the memory business. And the Japanese were just clubbing us to death on price. They, they could build memories a lot cheaper than MOS could ever. He wanted to be vertically integrated, and MOS was his strategy there. But he didn't use them at what they were really good at, at building processors and peripheral chips and stuff like that until later, when they got into 64 and the good stuff started coming out. Probably that was mostly Charlie Winnable getting more organized uh -huh. and pointed in the right direction. And there was some ego to that. You know, Yenis and, and Charpentier were kind of pissed that almost stole the Vic back away from them because we, we showed our foods together thing and ours had basic running on it and we could load games and we patched a bunch of games to have color in them and we showed it said, see, it's a, it's a computer. It has, you know, can save programs. Yours doesn't do anything but a demo. <laughs> but ours was ugly, you know, it's yeah, in yeah. a calculator yeah, case yeah. and it was obviously taped over holes with stickers and things like that. <laughs> just concludes the case. So, w was it like friendly competition between West Coast Commodore and East Coast Commodore, or was it I think it was got it pretty competitive there, but we weren't ill, I don't think we were mad at each other. Okay. We, we knew we were, you know, Jack was using divisions to try to get more out of them, uh -huh. pushing them against each other. Yeah, he, he would do that all the time. He was definitely into that. That's the way Jack was. <laughs> he was a character sometimes. Sometimes he was really docile and nice, and sometimes he just... I didn't get in too many jack attacks. I don't think I ever really had a whole jack attack. Oh, very I good. might have been near one when Chuck was getting one. Or something. Oh. Chuck was always going into his office and there was a lot of ranting and raving. And, oh. so you would hear it through the walls? The door was usually open. Oh, the door was open. <laughs> he was up in the oh, front at Scott Boulevard. That we were in that big, and the engineering was not far away from the front offices. We were just the next back, and then the back end of the building was all production. They were building pets back there. So when Jack raised his voice, was it like a loud yeah, bellowing he was voice? Pounding and yelling. And pounding? And pounding you mean? Pounding on the desk. Oh gosh. Jack was really good at arguing. I remember I'd go into meetings and argue with him about something. I think once I was arguing about the keyboard and what okay. was going on. I could lose an argument where I knew technically more than he did about uh -huh. the argument, but he was just better at arguing. <laughs> he'd find some way you were stumbling in the argument and he'd, he'd go at that. <laughs> he, he was just really quick. He, he would make you lose the argument, even though you were right. He could make you lose it. But he was he was quick to see that there was markets that needed to be jumped on and gone after. That was his forte. Watch the, the crowd and how they were responding and stuff like that. So so after the toy uh, uh, was stopped or canceled or it what, kind what, of just what, sort of faded. It, oh, it faded. Okay. Yeah. So when the toy faded, then then you went to work on the Vic Twenty or. Or how was that? How was that well, done? No, the Vic Twenty, you know, it was that competition. The guys in MOS had okay. it. Okay. We had it, and they kind of both showed up at a show together, and you know, we, we showed that you needed all this stuff. Uh huh. And then I think it kind of got back thrown. You know, Jackson gave it to Bob Russell because Russell's kind of one of it, one of his in, inside guys. Russell's okay. A software guy, and Russell knew he needed hardware guys to finish it because the thing that came out on MOS, he couldn't make a computer out of it. He couldn't really put a basic on it. It didn't have all the pieces you needed okay. to, to make a computer. You needed some way to store stuff like programs. You needed, it had, I think it had a keyboard, some of the other stuff, but it didn't have much peripheral I.O. or anything like that. So he kind of, we were already moved over to Moore Park. They had moved us all out of Commodore at Scott's okay. Boulevard because mm -hmm. we were getting so interrupted by production problems that the R&D guys couldn't get anything done. That's one of the reasons the toy was sort of the guys in production, something would break down there and you'd have to go down there and find out what it was and fix it for them. And then, so we kind of convinced Jack that we needed a production engineers and we needed new product engineers and they moved us to Moore Park and we started working on stuff there and Russell came over and he'd been kind of given the whole uh, Vic thing to finish. And he, so he would be considered the lead engineer for the Vic 20? 
yeah, he kind of dumped the whole thing in his lap. But huh. he knew he needed hardware guys because he was just a software guy. So he kind of came to me and he pleaded with me, and I got into it. And we started figuring out how to make it work, you know. And it pretty much ended like the prototype I had done because you know that that was about the only way. You, the Vic has a small memory space. It only can address 16K, I think. It only has what is it? 14 address lines Thir or something like 32K? that. 32K? 30, there's the, you could expand it up to 32K. And maybe no, but the actual vi video chip. Oh, okay. It only has, coming out of it, the video chip only has 14 address lines. So you had to figure out a way to map it into the pet space and make it all work. And that was kind of the tricky part that Russell and I figured out and put some gates in and made it work. And we had to figure out a way so we could make it as cheap as possible mm -hmm. so we could meet Jack's $200 price point. So static RAM is what was in them. The Vic had to work with static RAM, and they were expensive, so we tried to get the RAM down as low as we could, and I think we were down to like 5K. 6502 has two special spots that its memory grab. It's got a zero page and a page one. Zero page is all those registers you can get to with very simple one or two byte instructions, and they're very fast and very efficient. So you need to have a zero page memory, and then page one is your stack. So the stack's always in page one, and Page is 256 bytes in a 6502, and the, and the registers all 8-bit registers. Like if you're indexing through the page with the X register, you can only go through one page, and that was kind of its limitation. And so we had to put memory down low for zero page in page one. So one K of the Vic was down there, and then we skipped like three K, and the next four K boundary we put the remaining to make up the total of five K. It's in a basic Vic 20. It's really crazy, and then when you buy a 3K cartridge, you yeah. get like all of 8K or something there, and you could buy bigger cartridges. Right. But it was kind of a kludgy way to get around this problem. Luckily, the basic could do this. You could figure out that it had more memory and could move where it was putting the programs and stuff like that. I think Fagans figured that out, or Russell, that maybe Russell was doing that at that time. Fagans was off doing something else that he was working on. When did you, uh, so so you worked on the VIC-20, and when the VIC-20 came out, it was a big success. Well, it actually went to Japan. They made it Okay. Happen. They made the, they, the big keyboard decision, the nice uh -huh. rounded look. They, Jack kind of gave it to the Japanese, because once again, he's playing different groups of engineering, like Japanese engineering against the MOS guys, and the, and he, he gave it all to, what was it, Tony Tokai or Yash or some of those guys in the Japanese Commodore, and they... They kind of pulled it all together, looked at all my design and Russell's design, figured out how to make a producible board that they could okay. build with their equipment, put it in a box, came up with that keyboard, the big keyboard, because hmm. Jack didn't want to make that mistake again. He got too much flack on the chiclet keyboard. Okay. So they put a real keyboard in it uh -huh. and kind of came up with this nice, soft, rounded look. That was kind of a, a calculator guy. They laid that out. And it came back, and we were like, Wow, those guys did a really good job. <laughs> we were really impressed. <laughs> more part, you know, was, these guys did a good job on the case, and everything looks good. And said, go, go for it, you know. And they started making it. I think they put it in Japan first. Uh, yes, I believe so. What was it called in Japan before? It, the Vic, two, the one thousand and one. Yeah, the one thousand one, the Vic one thousand one. I guess that was a play on two thousand one pet. I don't know. Well, was so was the the 1001 was different than the Vic 20 in I, I forget. Uh, I don't think it was that much different. It wasn't that much different. Oh, okay. I don't know. They, I'm sure they optimized as they got more into production. They discovered things they could save some money on and move some things around. There was probably some minor changes, but not nothing major. I'm I'm trying to relate between the Vic 1001 and the Vic 20 as I do with the Commodore Max, yeah. the Max machine. And the Commodore 64. Yeah. So. so, the Max is a better 64. It is the back. Oh. The Max is a better 64. That was the game machine. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that was the game machine that came out of Japan. Yeah. They took a 64 yeah. and kind of lobotomized it. Right. Yeah. They were real into games over there. They could write lots of games. Mm -hmm. right? In fact, the, one of the guys in early Commodore Japan ended up to being the Nintendo guy, right? Mm -hmm. There's Ooh. a lot of relationships yeah, there. Yeah. The guy know. ended up running Nintendo. What was his name? I don't know. Or somebody. He was like a, a groupie at Commodore Japan. He just didn't <laughs> write games. Yeah, they, they weren't even paying him. Oh, wow. He was like a cleaning, spy. Cleaning out the garbage cans and everything. Oh, wow. No, but he, he got really good at writing games and he somehow got into Nintendo and then ended up to be the president. He moved on to 
bigger and better things. Wow, bigger and better. A lot of crazy people that got starts. Like the guy that did Linux, his first machine was either a 64 or a VIC. Something like that, yeah, yeah. He, he said that was the first machine he programmed on. I was like, wow, that's pretty scary. Um, um, when did you leave CBM? Oh, yeah. oh, there was a big blow up with Chuck and Jack about the the business machine part of it. Right. And Chuck thinks that, thought the company should be building two divisions, you know, the low cost, thick Commodore stuff, and then, then there's the high end business machines. And uh -huh. Jack didn't want to go that way. Right. And they had a big blow up over it. So Chuck pretty much just quit because they were going to move him. They, they put you in purgatory is kind of what the story was. Purgatory? Was. Yeah, if you were like in disfavor with Jack, he'd send you off to some other remote branch of Commodore in the okay. other part of the country and you sort of work in the sales department or something. Okay. Because it happened to a lot of people that kind of got on the bad side of Jack for something they did wrong. And they were attempt trying to do that to Chuck and send him back east to work. Hmm. Dick Sanders or somebody like that. He uh, said, "No, I like California. I want to stay here." Mm -hmm. And he decided to just. And Chris Fish was fed up with Jack, and he had all his Commodore stock money, so he he had some money. And then there was another guy, I forget the other guy's name. That they spun off and started the company Serious Systems, and decided to move it up to Scotts Valley because of Seagate was up there. Okay. Tom Mitchell was up there working at Seagate. Tom Mitchell was our production guy at Commodore when I was down in uh, Scott's, Scott Boulevard. He was running projection production. He was like the ex-Marine guy that would whip the production guys in one. He was a real great guy for components. I remember he was, he had like a whole bunch of extra parts that he would kind of trade with other companies that had surpluses of things he needed. They would like go to the bar and say, oh, I got these parts, I'll give you those if you'll give me some of those. Because <laughs> the, back then the, the, there was not enough parts to build all these personal computers. The, mm. the, the vendors like TI and stuff couldn't build enough TTL, especially things like the 244s and 245 buffer chips. They were really popular, everybody was using them. You could get them, they just disappeared. Tom Mitchell was like the dealer, dealer for getting parts. And he, he had moved up to Seagate, and they'd started that startup making hard drives in Scotts Valley. And uh, we talked to Tom, and he said, uh, yeah, this is a good deal, because there's a ton of engineers that drive over Highway 17 every evening, and they don't want to work in Santa Clara anymore. They live in, you know, Santa Cruz. Right. And you can get them for cheap, and they work real good, and they like to stay. So when Chuck Peddle left, then that's that's when you left. CBO? Not right away. I was there for another maybe a month or so. Oh, okay. They, he he wouldn't tell you anything about what he was working on. See, he had gone through this big thing with Motorola back at MOS. The you know the original 6502, the very first part they made was a 6501. Right. It had the exact footprint as a Motorola 6800. Motorola already had this 8-bit processor, and they were trying yeah. to sell it, yeah. and it would go right in the same socket. I'm running one right over there. <laughs> you got a 6800? Right over there, yeah. yeah. Right. And it would kick its butt, because Motorola had done some really wrong things in their architecture. The, the most obvious one is it's an 8-bit machine, but you've got 16-bit addressing, so you've got two bytes, right? But Motorola would fetch the high byte first, and then the low byte. It was like little Indian, big exactly Indian, kind of backwards. Indian, yeah. It's the Indian. Yeah. yeah. And and if you fetch the low byte first, like the, you could do things like increment while you're fetching the high byte. You could pipeline and get more efficiency, and that's what the 65 would do. It, it was pipelining early on. It was fetching things ahead of time, and that was one of the things. And they obviously didn't understand indexing and do the index registers like the 6502 did. So if you plugged a 6501 and a 6800, it wouldn't run their code, but if you wrote the same code, it would kick its butt. It would run almost, you know, 50% faster or something like that. It, Motorola didn't like that, so they, this whole group of guys with Chuck had left Motorola to go do MOS technology, and Motorola was mad at them, so they sued him. And they, the whole suit ended up because one of the draftsmen that came with them had stuff at home that was Motorola proprietary stuff, some documents and stuff, and they caught him with it. And Oops. They lost the lawsuit, and I think MOS had to pay like a million dollars and stop making the 6501. Mm. And that's why there's a 6502, which won't plug into a 6800 socket and work. It's different pinout. Mm. And that kind of hurt him bad. And Jack, uh, Chuck learned the lesson that you can't take any paper, any prototypes, anything with you when you leave a company. He says, and when we were going to leave Commodore, he said, don't bring anything but what you know.
because they can't take that away from you. Mm. They can't. The lawyers can't write the fine print that says what's in your brain belongs to the other company. They'll try. They've tried, but it doesn't work in, when you get to court. And we were pretty, you know, he wouldn't even tell me what he was working on. He says, I'm just starting a new company, was about all they told me. And I think uh, Fagans didn't want to go. Uh, Glenn Stark went. I think Patterson went. A bunch of the, the original group went with Chuck. And then I finally came like a month later because, you know, I wasn't sure what was going on. And he was already up in Scotts Valley. In fact, we, we were in the same building I'm working in now. Uh -huh. I'm, I'm in the same row of crazy, funny buildings working for a company that was when, when we moved up there for this startup. I was like eight doors down in a little hole in the wall place up there starting the early design of that machine. We really went up there. What, what was your original background in education and uh, getting started in this business? Well, I, I started as a. Well, I always was playing with wires to, as a little kid. Yeah. You know, I was the kid out in the street with the hammer and the clock, you know, <laughs> taking it yeah. apart. Mm -hmm. oh. I eventually learned to take things apart and put them back together. You know, and, you know, my dad helped me learn to solder with the big old soldering iron that you stick on the... The gun? No, the no, no. It was like a hunk of copper on the end of a stick and you stick it on the <laughs> corner. You know, one of those kind. Oh. I remember him helping me solder together a little Morse code thing with a light and a key, you know, so I could send Morse code to my friend in the house next door or something like that. And, <laughs> and uh, then I went on and, you know, I knew I was going to play with electronics because I was always <laughs> blowing things up in the garage and doing crazy projects. <laughs> I went to college in Tampa, Florida, at the mm. University of South Florida, got a degree in BS, double E, e in electronics. Mm -hmm. I kept talking to those guys up there about microprocessors because hey, I think we had some like 4004s and stuff by that time. But they were like power engineers and stuff that people went off for Tennessee Valley Authority out of my college and hmm. for the power company and stuff. <laughs> but they did have some computers in college and I, I met Larry there and worked on PDP-11s and wrote software and got acquainted with the assembly code way back then. So I graduated with a degree and I met Chuck at Allied Leisure and then I came out to California to find fame and fortune and drove my little yellow car all the way across the country and stopped to visit friends I knew all along the way. After CBM, what did you go on to do? Well, we did the Sirius Systems and the Victor thing. And that got pretty big in Europe. And, and then we had an OEM in the U.S. called the Victor. They were selling cash registers and calculators. Huh. And they wanted a computer. They thought they might. They had a sales force and a pretty big organization. Hmm. They were part of KIDA, makes the fire extinguishers, you know. Oh. That was their money, I think. And they. Uh, we made a special version of the uh, Sirius system. We had a nicely styled version that was sold in Europe, and then there was a more of a business-like looking one that, that Victor was just different plastics on basically the same oh. insides, and they sold that in America. And we got really big in France, in Germany, as Sirius systems, because those guys over there, that's, this is the time of the IBM PC and stuff. Uh -huh. It was getting really big, and they didn't trust IBM. <laughs> the, the Germans and the French didn't trust them. They, those guys were pretty ruthless. And they liked our machine. We had better screen, and we had a bigger floppy, and better peripheral, you know, interface. And it pretty much, you know, was basically the same 8088 processor huh. as the PC had in it. But it wasn't, it wouldn't run IBM code. You used them differently. Yeah, yeah. I did the screen on the uh, Victor machines, so and the serious machines. It was basically another step forward from the 80 column PET. But I, we had a little bit trickier way, but we could do bitmap graphics. In fact, that's the first machines that AutoCAD ran on, was the Victor machines. We gave them a few machines and they we taught them how to make bitmap graphics on it because it was a little different than normal bitmap graphics. But it had a nice high-res green screen like that and you could uh, do some really nice line drawing and stuff on it. So they liked it a lot, but it wasn't IBM compatible. So that killed us at Victor and we got into Chapter 11 because we couldn't oh. run all the software. And, uh -huh. So eventually we uh, shut down the whole Victor thing. What did I go on to do there? I think we, I ended up working at, at uh, NNA. No, that was Tandon. We were working for Tandon Design and Stuff. Tandon makes disk drives right. and floppy disks. Right. Juggy Tandon developed the double-sided head for the floppy. Floppies usually only had one head, and he right. came up with a way you could put a head on both sides of the floppy and write on both sides, and that was his claim to his money. And he, he started getting into hard drives, and so we, we started building machines for Tandon after, after that. That closed down, and we formed a company called NNA, which was in Scotts Valley, which is kind of the whole Commodore group. NNA means 
means name not available. <laughs> you picked some name, name, and the lawyers went off to get the name, and it was already taken. N -N so they put N N A down. <laughs> and we said, "Well, that's okay. Use that." <laughs> yeah. And that was doing all kinds of stuff, mostly kind of tandem-like stuff. And after that, what did I go do? Did I do the Divix thing? I did Divix for a while. You did Divix? Yeah. yeah. Ooh. yeah well, everybody hated Divix. Wow. Right? Divix was a video game thing. I mean, a video movie playing thing. Yeah. I hated it. I don't know why. We had such <laughs> a popular unrest about it. Because when you buy a DVD, you kind of feel like you own it. But in Divix, you just bought the right to watch it for 48 hours when you bought it. But it was really cheap. It was like $3, right. 2 bucks. You get this DVD with a movie on it. And you could, whenever you put it in your machine from that time on, you <laughs> 48 hours to watch it as much as you want. <laughs> After that, if you came back a week later and put it in, you'd have to pay some more money. To get another 48 hour current size DVD? They were exactly like not, DVDs. Not the so they would self destruct? No, no, they were they were just, just triple des encrypted. Just kept the record of what you did. It's all based on what the movie industry wants. The movie industry is all based on the theater, a ticket. Mm -hmm. Everything. Even when you used to get movies on airplanes, you yeah. pay for those. Mm -hmm. There was a ticket issued, and they got like half of that. You know, half of what you paid, Hollywood got half of that. They like the ticket idea because it's an accounting thing. They keep track of it. So everything's based on that. So we had that same kind of deal. You get the movies from Hollywood. We would compress them and put them on the DVDs, but they were encrypted. So you could put them in a regular DVD player, and you'd get the, the DivX screen, and it said, oh, no, no, you need a special DVD player to play this, and that's all it would say. If you put it in our machine, and your machine was legit, and it, you know, had it would issue a ticket and you would get billed for it on your account, you know, whatever it was, you know, two two dollars, two fifty and stuff like that. People didn't like the fact that they bought the D V D but they didn't really have the movie. Yeah. Hollywood's really touchy about when they give things out and what their value is, you know. When they go to the theaters that's their number one thing and then the next thing is I don't know, it's the movie, airplane stuff or the rental business and all that. So we were pretty close to that. It was done by Circuit City. So I did the chips that were involved with the, uh, some of the chips were designed in that to do the encryption stuff and everything. Hmm. There was a special encryption. We had like a whole bunch of NSA guys working on that project. What? Wow. NSA? Yes, they were scary. What? They were guys in suits, and really clean, calm, demure, but you know their little brains are like going, you know, they were really paranoid kind of guys, super wow. good about security though. Because they were back in Richmond, Virginia, and there's a ton of government kind of stuff going on back there with, you know, the military and everything else. And those guys were available. They had like 140 people programming on that project. What we were doing is we were putting a little subsystem into standard DVD players. We did one for LG. We did one for JVC. We did one. They had the, Sonic. They had 140 people working on that project. Yeah, that was just How? the software. Group. Oh, how many people worked on the VIC-20 project? Well, let's see, Moore Park, when we were really crashing to get it done, we, got, we finally kind of got Chuck relented and let us work on it, and he started pulling some people in, and we decided we couldn't put the IEEE 488 on it, so we needed something like it, but maybe serial and less expensive. Uh -huh. So he got somebody called Bob Medcalf. You ever heard of that name? Com, 3Com? The Ethernet. Mm. Oh, okay. And he he was working at Xerox Park, and Chuck knew him, and he came in and he gave us this whole lecture on Ethernet. And Ethernet wasn't even happening yet, and we all he scratched all of us on the board, and we're going, wow, this is a super cool idea, you know, because the original Ethernet was coax, and the way it worked is you jump on the coax and you'd send a message, and if somebody else jumped on at the same time, there was a collision and the message was garbled, so you'd both randomly time out and jump on later, so you wouldn't collide again. And that was a real clever scheme because you would all be sharing this common plumbing. But, and we thought, well, this is a super good idea, but it's too expensive for the VIC-20 because the speed and the rates he wanted to do it. But we knew we needed something serial, so he kind of convinced us that's the way to go. And they started working on a serial version of the IEEE 488. Glenn and Scott Patterson kind of came with that. The original disk drive was really clever. It was uh, the two floppy drive for the pet had two 6502s in it. I think one of them was a 6504. What? It was like the controller that was doing the controlling the, the, the little drive. And the other one was sort of the operating system that was talking over the IEEE and handling the file structure and all that. And they both shared this common memory of, of, that they could talk through. And the neat thing about 6502 is 
if you put their clocks out of phase, they could both talk to the memory at the same time and they wouldn't collide because they only jumped on the memory on one half of the clock. And you could share memory that way, and that's how it worked in that disk drive. But in the, the little one for this thing, we didn't want to put two processors in it, so they figured out a way to do it with one, kind of with interrupts and stuff like that. But it used group coding and some other state-of-the-art things to encode, and it was clever. I have, I have a friend up in Walnut Creek who has a, well, it looks like a, 20, a PET 2031. It, it, uh, yeah, okay, it's in a, in a metal case, it's a disk drive, and, but it doesn't say PET 2031 on it. It says something like VIC 1540. Okay, what? And I look around the back of it, and I don't see, I don't see the, you know, the, the parallel connector, the, or, I'm sorry, the, the IEEE connector. I see a serial connector. Go, what the heck is this thing? Might have been so one of it, the early prototypes. Yeah, I think it's a prototype. Hang on to that. Wow. So there were some of those around when they, they used the original box bro, to build it in. Yeah, that was a pretty clever floppy design. We went on to do more of that. They, they, I think we were, weren't we doing variable speed on that one, or was that later on? Uh, that was the big remember. floppy at Commodore. We had a small floppy, and then there was a later on one that had more storage on it. Well, yeah, here, here, here's, a, here's, a, here's a question. Okay, I've never seen uh, a CBM or a, a, a Commodore 8 inch floppy drive. Was there ever such a thing? Because yeah, I've, I've, I've seen a picture. I've seen a picture. I've never seen one in person. Is there really I'm an not eight sure inch? I did either. That was the group in Phoenix with Bob Taylor. I okay. Think, was working on that, that floppy drive. Mm -hmm. Is that the one with the software refresh for the dynamic RAM? It's driving Fagan's crazy. No, no. Dynamic RAM, you have to refresh periodically or the, it'll lose its bits because the bits are just held in a capacitor. So you refresh it periodically. And usually you have hardware that's doing that. It's kind of taking the memory time away from the thing that needs it and does the refresh. And they thought they were clever, so they, they had like an interrupt that go off on the required amount of time, and it, it, they had instructions that would execute this way while they were reading that way through memory. So that all you had to do was run through a certain number of addresses in the memory, and the memory would refresh. But the code was clever, so that as it was doing the code, it was executing enough, and it was reading the other direction. Well, so it only had to go about halfway because it was working itself together to read enough. I think you had to read all 128 addresses in a, in a row or something like that. To I forget how the ERAM works now. But, and that was really tricky. But if you were debugging it and you stopped it to, to, to debug and it, you put a breakpoint in, their memory forgot. Hmm. It wasn't getting refreshed. So it was impossible to single step and do things that you could typically do in debug. I remember Fagan's complaining about that. I think they wired him up some way of doing it in, in hardware so it would work, so he could do the real debug on it, because it was driving him crazy. He couldn't stop the thing and find out why his code wasn't working. But I, I don't think I ever saw an 8-inch floppy. Hmm. Wow. Maybe it came by. <laughs> I don't know. Probably was working on something else. <laughs> Uh, what are you doing these days, uh, Bill? I'm still in Scotts Valley, and I'm working for a little company called IDE. The joke around work is, I do everything, is what that means. <laughs> it's, a, it's a little design company that's been there about, it's been there, we just did our 30th anniversary. Oh. 30 years, and the, the guy that started it was uh, Dave Marconi and Peter Sunnell. They were both worked at uh, Victor. Okay. Sunnell worked with Chuck back at Commodore in early days. And it, it mostly was a mechanical design company to do designs and skins and plastics. Marconi was working for us at, at uh, Sirius Systems at Victor doing the skins and the mechanical design for all the inside of the boxes and stuff. He was a really good, he's an Italian guy, so he has the Italian look, Ferrari kind of <laughs> Bosch look of things and stuff. And he was designing stuff. So this company's been doing all kinds of designs from bicycle frames, hmm memory sticks to a lot of medical instruments and things like that lately. Like now we're working on a floor heating system for houses. You know, they run the water pipes through your floor and heat up your, this company in Aptos doesn't have a control system for it. They just sell the piping and the flooring and they want to, so Glenn and I have been working on the pieces to put that together and you know, there's like a brain for it that all the thermostats talk to. You have a thermostat in every room and it tells when to pump water through where, which pipes and all that stuff. Kind of looks like the the one room in your house. Kind of looks like a submarine with all these pipes coming. Oh, uh, <laughs> wow! It's valves. It's pretty pretty cool. And that's one of the projects we're working on. And we did a 
you know, slide scanners. We've done lots of crazy <coughs> things for people. <coughs> because of the new medical thing, all the stuff medical now has to be digital. You know, all those archived slides from all your biopsies and stuff have to be digitized. So there's companies that like, we did a carousel for one company that held 360 slides or something like that. And it worked kind of like those old record changer things. And the robot would pull a slide out, uh -huh. put it in the little camera thing, and take uh -huh. a picture of it, put it back, and it could like process all these slides so that they can digitize all the old stuff. Because <laughs> it's now mandated, and it has to be digital. And all those, so there's a ton of companies out there doing stuff like that. There's, what else we've been working on? Toy cars for kids. It was like these little cars you could push around. They had a real little suspension in it with springs and shocks, and the kids push them around with their fingers, and they turn. Real expensive toys. Just they, there, there's a great poster at the website, ideinc.com, of all the stuff we worked on for 30 years. And there's some stuff at the beginning that I worked on, because <laughs> I had Dave work on one, when I was working for a company called Elenex. I did a notebook for them, and Dave did the case. Dave Marconi. Oh, okay. At, at IDE, he, I, because I knew he was a good designer, and I, you know, got him hooked up with the guys. This was a company in England that was sort of like Dell. You know, they were selling computers like Dell did, you know, or, it, or a Gateway or something like that. You order a whole system for your company, and they put it in boxes, and it was had all the software installed and everything, had servers, networking, and everything. And you just hook it together, and it worked. Do you, do you still see uh, Chuck Peddle every once in a while? I had lunch with him maybe about a month ago. Ah. Yeah, we got together because Glenn Stark, he's the guy that did the floppy, all the floppies, the hardware for him. He still works with me at uh, IDE. He's not a full-time employee, he's part-time. He's playing more than he's working, <laughs> but he's, he's, uh, he had found Peter Jennings again because he was playing with the little board that uh, Roboto was using the little 8266 ESP board, and, and Peter Jennings has been playing with it. And he had a website with like a GUI that helped you put yeah. code into it. Glenn found him because Glenn and Peter Jennings both paraglide. And, oh, and wow. Peter, Peter's history goes back to the early days of Commodore. We've, we, I, one of the first projects they stuck me in charge of when they first hired me was Kim One. Yeah. Nobody was <laughs> managing Kim One at Commodore, they didn't know what it was. And that was like their, their demo board for your first 6502 is that 8 by 11 board with a keyboard and a little simple display on it. And uh, Peter wrote a chess game called Micro Chess for that. It's like a 1K chess game. This, this little board only had 1K of memory in it, RAM memory, and you could manually put the instructions in byte by byte. And Peter did that and wrote a 1K chess game. And Chuck and I had found this, or I found it, and I said, hey Chuck, let's order this game. So we bought it and sent it to you know, put it in the little Kim one, and we were playing it one night, and it was beating us, beating us really badly. <laughs> we were getting really mad. I mean, it took our queen away, like, in the fifth mood, because it was <laughs> killing us, you know. <laughs> Holy cow, it was really aggressive. <laughs> and so we sat down that night, and finally, in the end game, it kind of fell apart, and we kind of beat it. <laughs> but I said, wow, this is really good for 1K. <laughs> yeah. So, and at the time, there was chess games. You could buy little kind of calculator-sized chess games, like Chess Challenger. And Commodore thought, maybe we better get in the game business. Uh -huh. So we designed up a chess game. We hired Peter. He wrote like a 3K version of this called Micro Chess. And we put it in this thing. And I did this display and the audio for it. And it, you'd get a little chess board of pieces. And it had, you know, the numbers on the board. And it told you how to move them around. And you played chess against it. And it played pretty good. And we actually went to some thing where we played all the other ones. And we, I think we got third place or something. Oh. That. We did pretty well. Well, if you could put in a good word to Peter Jennings for us. <laughs> he's he's a, invited to Convex, too. He, he's, a, he's a Kim guy. He, he, he's, yeah. he's a real hack kind of a guy. But he's off playing with Wi-Fi processors and arms and things like that, and GoPros. And, but Go Peter made all his money when he took that uh, chess game and he put it on the Radio Shack Trash 80. Yep. Oh. He sold like a million of those things. Oh. And he made a ton of money. Wow. He put on a cassette, and they sold a lot of them. And he started this company called Personal Software with Dan Falstrom. Dan was like the Harvard business kind of guy in a three-piece suit and everything like that. Very, very clean cut. And they, personal software, was originally writing games for pets and stuff. And this guys from MIT came and said, we've got this really cool idea, but we need a computer to program it on. And the guys, Peter said they, they had an Apple II in the corner they weren't using. You could use that. This program was called VisiCalc. <laughs> and 
they came to Commodore not long after that. They'd finished it, and they gave us a big demo in the conference room. They had all those engineers in there, and, we were, and they showed us the whole spreadsheet idea. You make this box equal to this box plus that box, and said, whoa, that's cool. We thought that was a really great idea, but we didn't know what we'd do with it. Being engineers, you know. Uh. The accountant saw it and said, wow, we need that. <laughs> and it, it only was working on an Apple II with its little floppy, and people would go to the Apple stores and say, I need VisiCalc. They said, do you have a computer? No. Okay. <laughs> you have to buy an Apple II and a floppy and a monitor. And they bought the whole system just to get VisiCalc. They wanted it that bad. So Peter started personal software, and they did VisiCalc and made a ton of money. He kind of became an entrepreneur. And then he kind of retired and just traveled around the world, paragliding and driving all over Europe. And he's, he, he has a house in Ben Lomond, and he now... And sometimes he, in wintertime he's down in Bun Loman, and in summer he's up in Vancouver or something. He's Canadian. Mm -hmm. And we got together with Glenn and Peter and Chuck and had lunch in Malone's. Malone's is the classic place in Scotts Valley that Seagate and everybody usually had lunch. It's just kind of a bar and grill place. And we talked all the times and stuff. Chuck's getting old. And He's still a character. He tends to dominate the whole meeting. <laughs> Orders all the hors d'oeuvres. Chuck's still Chuck. But he, he's working on something with Glenn. I don't know what it is. It's something to do with the uh, memory or something. They're doing some kind of memory thing. I don't know how all. You know, Glenn's off doing that on the side with Chuck. Something to do with flash memory. Some kind of control chip. I think it has a lot of 6502s in it or something. <laughs> and Glenn's shaking his head. He says, there's better processors. Because <laughs> Glenn's really, he's into everything. Arduinos and ARM processors and all kinds of crazy stuff. He's always on the cutting edge of everything. I've learned so much just hanging around Glenn. He's, he's always buying something. And I've been doing that lately anymore. I'm always on Alibaba buying some new gizmo <laughs> for $3. It's got all this potential and we'll play with it. That, that's really changed. The whole hobby market is kind of blown up mm -hmm. out there. You guys have probably seen that. You get a lot of electronics. There's a lot of stuff now in a small packet. It's really great. You guys have any questions for Bill? So you guys are all big up? 20 guys. <laughs> <laughs>